everybody, this is God's Hot for the Sad Truth. Today I wanted to uh, discuss with you ways by which we can measure an academic's influence. I spent about an hour and a half this afternoon preparing uh, this lecture for you. Uh, so here we go. But before I start, can you think of ways by which we might measure such influence? Uh, you'll be surprised to know that there are actually uh, many more ways than you might typically imagine. So here we go, let's start. Uh, so possible metrics of scientific eminence. Well, I guess the most, uh, you know, the oldest way or the most common way in the past when we didn't have quite as uh, sophisticated a set of bibliometrics was to simply uh, measure or count the number of publications that a, a professor had. So for example, Professor A might have had uh, 25 journal articles published and zero books. And Professor B had 15 articles published and two books. And then the question becomes, so which is, I mean, which is greater? 25 is obviously greater than five, than 15, but then the other the other person has two books. And so we we'd basically do a brute count in deciding who is a more productive scholar. Of course, one can uh, try to come up with a more uh, granular or more, uh, you know, accurate uh, way of measuring publications by incorporating fractional publications or adjusting for co-authors. So, for example, uh, if you have a if you have Professor A uh, who has published twenty five journal articles, fifteen of which are as a sole author. It's only him who's published who's the author on those papers, and ten as first author in, in multi authored papers. That means he's either the f the sole author or the first author on all 25 papers. Uh, so he's very much uh, driving each of those uh, publications. Whereas Professor B also has 25 journal articles. So if we're only looking at the number of journal articles, they would be tied. But Professor B has none as a sole author, uh, two as a first author, and the rest as second author or further down the author uh, you know, order. Uh, and therefore, of course, in this case, one would say all other things equal. Professor A has a stronger record. Uh, in some cases, and you see this actually quite often in uh, the marketing academic disciplines, uh, what determines, if you like, your eminence is just the total number of publications you have in a specific set of journals. Uh, so, for example, it has to be in the elite marketing journals, and it has to be in these four particular journals. And anything that doesn't exist in the within the context of those particular journals somehow ceases to exist or matter. So, for example... Professor A has 25 journal articles, eight of which are in the relevant A-level outlets, whereas Professor B has 20 journal articles, hence that particular professor has fewer number of journal articles, but 14 of which are A-level outlets. So if we were only looking at the total number of peer-reviewed journal articles, then Professor A would win, but if we're looking at only the subset of journals that are considered A-level outlets, then Professor B would win. All right, moving on. Uh, I don't know why it takes a while to... Okay, here we go. The fourth possible way we could measure, uh, and these are the ones that I've come up with. I'm sure that there are many, many other ways to do so, but these are some of sort of the, uh, the, the first ones that came to mind. So number fourth uh, method for measuring scientific eminence is, if you'd like, it's a weighted additive rule. So the total number of publications multiplied by the prestige of each publication. So you do take into account all of the publications, but you weigh them by the prestige of each outlet. So Professor A may have 12 A-level publications and 18 uh, B-level publications. So in total, uh, she has uh, 30 publications in this case, but then you would adjust them for the fact that you know 12 are A and 18 are B, whereas Professor B has uh, 20 A-level publications and two B-level publications. So in total, 22 publications versus 30 publications, but then you'd have to actually calculate the weighted additive score to determine uh, in this using, using this metric who has a more uh, productive record. Of course, all of these measures that I've discussed so far are looking at a count of the number of publications. But if you're looking at the, the eminence or the importance or the influence of an academic, 
then there is no point in uh, publishing research if nobody reads it. Well, not there's no point, but uh, you know, you ultimately would like to think that people are going to read your work and are going to cite your work. And so now with the uh, availability of all sorts of bibliometric uh, measures, we're able to very easily say through Google Scholar, right? You could you could go and you could enter my name uh, on, on Google Scholar, and you could know you know how many total citations I have, and so on. Uh, here, when we mean by citations, we don't mean uh, you know whether I was uh, cited in Time Magazine or in uh, you know in uh, on Fox News or CNN. Uh, here, we're talking about uh, academic citations. So, if you've been cited a hundred times. That means that other publications, other academic publications, have cited your work a uh, hundred times, and so the total number of citations of a academic would be exactly that. If you look at his or her total number of publications, how many times have they been cumulatively cited? So Professor A might have fifty publications that have been cited one thousand times in total. Professor B has thirty publications that have been cited three thousand times. Well, if we had only looked at the number of publications, of course, Professor A would, quote, win. But then it turns out that Professor A's work has been cited three times less than that of Professor B. So number of citations looks at, of course, uh, how much your research uh, has been diffused or has been used, has been cited by others. Uh, and of course, one can calculate then that this flows from uh, this measure here the average number of citations per publication. So Professor A in the example above has 20 citations per publication, right? 1,000 divided by 50, whereas Professor B has uh, 3,000 divided by 30. So average number of citations is higher for Professor B. So even though that professor has uh, published fewer works, uh, his work has been more influential. Uh, two more to go uh, before I go on to the next measure. Uh, so we could look also at the total number of publications with at least X number of citations each. Uh, so you may have, uh, you know, a hundred publications, but then you might say, but how many of those publications have at least 10 citations each? And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what Google Scholar does. If you go to Google Scholar, you'll see they report something called the I-10 index, which is namely the number of publications that Scholar has that have been cited 10 times or more. There's nothing magical about the number 10. It's just that 10 represents, you know, a paper or a book that has at least received some attention. It's been cited by 10 other works. So Professor A may have 2,000 total citations and an I-10 index of 25. Professor B might have double the total number of citations at 4,000, but uh, her I index is only three. Now, what does that mean? That basically means that probably that professor had one publication that was a real home run, one publication that received, you know, many, many citations. And so in this case, what you're looking at is the fact that how skewed is your distribution of citations. And then next one, number eight, the total number of citations for your why most cited papers. So for example, even if you have a hundred different publications, uh, you often have, for example, on a grant application, they tell you, please list your five most important works. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in this case, your five most important works might correspond to your five most cited papers. It, it, it need not be so, uh, because sometimes it takes a while before a paper uh, or a book gets sufficiently cited. But uh, this is, if you'd like, a shortcut, a quick way to gauge, uh, you know, how influential your most important work was. So in this case, we might say, uh, okay, let's look at this example. Both professors, uh, Professor A has 4,000 citations in total, while Professor B has 5,000 citations. But then if we look at uh, their respective five most cited, how many times have their five most cited works been cited? Well, Professor A's five most cited have yielded 2,000 citations, meaning uh, his five most important works constitute 50% of his uh, total number of citations, whereas for Professor B, his uh, five most uh, cited works uh, correspond to 20% of his total citations. And so again, this is a quick way to measure how, you know, how uh, influential 
your biggest home runs uh, have been. All right, and now let's move on to another index. So more than 10 years ago now, uh, Hirsch uh, in 2005 proposed an index that has now become uh, quite popular. And actually, uh, I very, very early uh, learned of this index and then published uh, two papers uh, looking at how to use the H index in, in various ways. I published two papers in a journal called Cytometrics, and I have a third paper that's conditionally accepted, but it's now been several years since I've actually uh, completed my final set of revisions. I hope that uh, I could still submit it and get it accepted. Let's let's see what the editor says. But in any case, let me uh, explain what the H index is. So the H index, you know, the, the best way to do it is to actually show you the, uh, an example. So let's suppose we have a scholar uh, who has 15 publications with the following number of citations in decreasing order. What does that mean? So his, his most cited paper or, or book uh, has 100 citations. His second most, 79. His third most, 50 citations. And so we keep going down, and we keep going down unt until that point when the ordinal rank exceeds the number of citations. So here, the ninth ranked publication has 12 citations. And then the 10th ranked publication has 8. 8 is less than 10, so that's where you would draw the line as the H index is equal to 9. So the H index is basically when you rank order all of the publications and while the number of citations is greater than the corresponding ordinal ranking. Okay, And so again, this is a very uh, good snapshot of looking at uh, a scholar's influence, again, to ensure that uh, the metric is not skewed. If you're only looking at total number of citations, look what might happen. So look at here, you've got two hypothetical bibliometric profiles. Professor A has uh, 2,000 total citations and an H index of 15. So what does that mean? That means uh, she has, for example, 15 publications that have 15 or more citations, and then her sixteenth, uh, you know, most cited uh, publication has fewer than than sixteen, and so her H index is uh, is fifteen. Now, Professor B has more citations, right? Professor B has three thousand citations. So, if we were only looking at number of citations, you would say, "Oh, gee, this professor has been cited way more than this professor, a thousand times more," but his H index is two, right? That means, well, that basically means that he's got, that a single home run could offer a rather skewed picture uh, if we were to solely focus on total number of citations. So again, H index, while it certainly has some bibliometric uh, flaws that one can discuss, it, it is now very much accepted as the measure by which we typically uh, if you like, quantify the influence of a scholar. So, so this gives you a very good sense of how we go about measuring the influence of an academic, both in terms of the number of publications that he or she has published and the number of citations that such publications have garnered. But now let's move on. Let's expand the sphere of influence beyond academia. So Hall in 2014 published a paper where he introduced the Kardashian index. And yes, we're talking here about uh, Kardashian as in the, the, you know, Kim Kardashian et al. And here the idea is that an academic's influence at times extends well beyond his or her academic discipline. Okay, of course. Public intellectuals have sizable influence among the masses. In other words, they're famous outside of the purview of their academic circles. But the Kardashian index is meant to capture, if you like, the ratio between uh, how influential a scientist is within his academic field versus, uh, you know, how famous he is outside of it. And so in this case, uh, this is measured via the proxy uh, metric of number of Twitter followers, right? So it's a measure of public outreach. So someone with a high Kardashian score might be very famous among the masses, 
but is hardly cited among his or her scientific colleagues. So a wonderful example of that would be Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, uh, you know, extraordinarily famous as a, <coughs> excuse me, science communicator. I think, I, I don't know exactly how many Twitter followers he has, but I suspect, you know, maybe many hundreds of thousands, if not uh, millions. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, I guess I should have checked. Uh, but in terms of his uh, scientific uh, citation record, I think it's uh, very, very minimal. I'm not even sure how many papers he's published in his scientific career. Uh, and for those of you who may be wondering where Bill Nye would score here, many people who have written to me when they, you know, let's say gotten upset uh, because I keep uh, uh, critiquing and mocking Bill Nye for some of his comments linking uh, uh, some realities in the Middle East with climate change, uh, they write to me saying, yeah, but you know, he's an important scientist and so on. Bill Nye is not a scientist. He's a He's strictly a science communicator. He's not, I don't think, as far as I know, that he's ever published anything. I think he's got a bachelor's degree in engineering. And so he is not a scientist. And I, I don't say this to denigrate him. I'm simply, I'm just, just simply setting the record straight. And I mentioned Bill Nye because since the Kardashian index has come out, there's now been another index that came out. This is called the Nye Krauss Index. Nye for Bill Nye and Krauss for Lawrence Krauss, who is the a uh, physicist who not only has been cited quite a bit, I think he's got over 13,000 Google Scholar citations, but he's also someone who has a very large Twitter following, I think, you know, several hundred thousand. Uh, so this is uh, Cone Powell's, who's actually a, a friend of mine. I uh, hung out with him. I was a visiting professor at Dartmouth College in 2002. When he was there and so we got to a chance to get to know each other back then and we've stayed we've remained friends and we're both very active uh on facebook certainly uh, in terms of my, on my personal page uh he's now in uh, turkey he's a professor of marketing in turkey uh, and so he came out uh, with the nye kraus index which is a measure of social media presence and scientific impact so very much similar to the kardashian index so he, he obtained data on 200 plus marketing professors and marketing scientists. Uh, I'll, I'll let you check out all the details. Here's the link to the actual article. You can check it out here. And uh, with all due modesty, only six received the A plus Krauss label. This basically means uh, academics, scientists who uh, not only were very highly cited in terms of their uh, scientific eminence, but who also had very large uh, public outreach. Six, only six professors received the A-plus Krauss label. And yes, you guessed it. And this includes yours truly with the fourth highest score. There you go. Uh, since we're talking about this idea of how to uh, measure the influence of a scientist, uh, some of you might be interested in this uh, organization. They're called, it's called Altmetrics, and you could check out their stuff. Uh, this is taken from their website right here at altmetric.com. What they basically do is they measure the influence of uh, academic works beyond simply how often they were cited by other colleagues, right? So... Papers can be discussed on blogs, on in Time magazine, on CNN. Uh, you could it could be tweeted about. Uh, so so all of the ways by which buzz is generated, by which the memes associated with a academic work might get diffused, Altmetric captures that, which I think is a wonderful idea. And I suspect, I predict, that uh, not too far from now, uh, it'll be part of an academic's CV. In other words you'll not only include the, you know, your list of publications and your, uh, you know, bibliometric scores in terms of how, how often you've been cited and so on, but probably you will also include your altmetric score. So here, what I've done is I've taken for you one of my papers published with one of my former doctoral students, Tripat Gill. This is a paper published in the leading uh, journal of uh, evolutionary behavioral sciences. It's Evolution and Human Behavior. This was a paper that we published in 2014. If you see here, it's got an altmetric score of 96, which basically means that out of, I think, several million scientific papers that have been published, 
it scores in the top 5% of, of scientific papers across all scientific disciplines in terms of how much buzz it has generated. Again, buzz, not simply in terms of how many times it's been cited within academia, but rather uh, just mimetic propagation. How much has it been discussed across all possible uh, forms of communication? So I, as I said, I suspect that this will become a, a staple part of uh, how academics uh, are, uh, are judged in terms of the importance of their work. So in conclusion, and this is something that many of you who follow me have heard me uh, speak about on numerous occasions, professors should be encouraged to not only create knowledge via basic research, but also disseminate it in the broadest possible ways. So nobody is saying that we should uh, you know, stop doing basic research or do less of it. Of course, this is a central feature of what it is to be a professor, but uh, university teaching should no longer be construed as the sole mode or the main mode of knowledge disse dissemination to a lay audience. Public engagement, especially given the widely available so social media tools, should constitute a central element of a professor's arsenal for mimetic propagation. Uh, of course, those of you who uh, follow my work know how, how strongly I feel about this. As a matter of fact, I spent today, Saturday afternoon, preparing this specific lecture for no other reason than to then post it on my YouTube channel, right? Of course, this should be construed as something that by which professors are judged. If this lecture now today uh, that I'll put up hopefully later today might be watched by several thousand people, uh, uh, I mean, clearly that is a, a an important element of uh, how we disseminate knowledge, certainly in the information age. So there you have it, folks. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. Uh, if you appreciate this work, again, uh, it's important that you try and share it. Uh, if you haven't contributed to my Patreon account and or my PayPal account, please do so. I'm trying to reach 600 Patreons. Uh, I've never reached that far. I've gotten up to about 580, 590, but I've never broken 600. I think I'm at maybe 570 something right now. So anything that you could contribute, it could be $1 a month. Uh, some people, I think the person who's contributed the most, I think gave $100 a month. And so somewhere between $100 and $1 a month is a sweet spot. Again, think about what it costs to go to university, $60,000 plus $1,000 a year. Uh, so giving a dollar or two or three or five per month for all of the content that I provide, I hope you'll agree is a fair deal. So hope you're having a great weekend. Uh, hope you enjoyed it and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.